Lord, we thank you that not even death itself can separate us from you and from everyone who belongs to you. And we thank you that because you have been raised from the dead, that we too will be raised from the dead. But it's also true that we begin to experience that resurrection power through the presence of your Holy Spirit changing us from the inside out. That we begin to know that you will resurrect us because we know the power of your resurrection through the Holy Spirit now. And so, Lord, we pray for your Holy Spirit as we open up your word, as we read. Lord, just connect us to who you are. In Jesus' name, amen. Y'all may be seated. And before we get to sermon, just put that over to the side there, yeah. Uh, We've got some other business to take care of. Today is an all-ages worship service. And during all-ages worship services, we do invite our kids to come forward, uh, not to come forward, our kids to worship with us. So if you've got small children and maybe they um, are a little fidgety, we do have activity packets out in the foyer and you can pick one up. And if you're an adult and you're fidgety and you want to use an activity packet, that's fine with me, okay? If Spanish is your first language, we do have a Spanish translation. You can talk to Joe over there, habla con Joe. Uh, porque nosotros tenemos traducción en español, something like that. Was that pretty good? That was close. All right. Uh, yeah, okay. I think that's all I had to say. Let's talk to these folks over here. Come forward. We have a brand new person here. Sophia. What is Sophia's middle name? Maddie. Maddie. Sophia Maddie Leaf. And I am glad you are here. And you look pretty happy. All right. Um, Sophia's parents are here to dedicate Sophia to the Lord. And so I'm going to ask for Frank and Crystal uh, to affirm their faith. So who is your Lord and your Savior? As a disciple of Jesus Christ, do you promise to teach Sophia the faith? to bring her to church and to do the best you can to pray for her and to model faith in Jesus. If so, you say we do? do. All right. So uh, not only are they a family, but we together are a family. And together we make promises to our children. And so do we, the people of Life Path Church, promise to teach our kids the faith, to be their Sunday school teachers, to be their youth volunteers, to pray for the children of our church, and to model the faith of Jesus Christ to our children as best we can. If so, will you say we do? We do. Oh, that was enthusiastic. I like that. All right. All right. So, Sophia, I would like to pray a blessing over you. Will you come to me or you want to stay with Dad? Let's try it. We're going to try it because you're about as cute as they come. All right. Look at all those people out there. All right. All right, let's pray for Sophia. And if you want to, you can raise a hand of blessing towards Sophia to pray for her. Father, we thank you for Sophia. And we thank you for all the children of this church. And Lord, we dedicate Sophia to you and to your purposes. And we pray, Lord, that all of your purposes for Sophia, that you have in your heart, that you had in your heart for her since the foundations of the world, that your promises will be fulfilled in her and that she would know you and love you and grow in wisdom each and every day of her life. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Now, I want you to look at this face, and I want you to know that this face is going to hold all of you accountable for the promises that you have made. So, welcome to this new little person into the family. All right, thank you all. Y'all may be seated. Very good. Well done. All right, we are not done yet because we have some kids, elementary age kids, coming forward and, uh, to, to get some Bibles. So if I could have those families come forward with their kids, maybe. Very good. All right. Just come. Yeah, we, we staying down here. Is that what we're doing? We staying down here? 
Okay, each of these families is going to receive a Bible. Jackie, what else do I need to say? Is that pretty much it? I'm going to introduce that we as a church give our kids and our families Bibles so that they can read them together and learn the Word of God. And we want to empower our parents to disciple their kids. And so now I'm handing it over to you, right? What what did I forget? Good morning. Okay. (laughs) All right. So we're going to have Joshua come up. He's going to read a scripture for us. So come on over here, Joshua. Do not let this book of the law depart from your mouth. Meditate on it day and night so that you may be careful to do everything with day and night. Then you will be prosperous and successful. Yeah. And so we're just going to pray as we hand the word of God to the kids today. And we wanted to do it in front of the congregation because we think it's important. The word is life. The word is truth. And um, let's pray. So if you would bow your heads and extend your hands towards these beautiful families and these wonderful kiddos. Father, we thank you for the privilege that we have to hold your word in our hands. We pray that these children will read it, meditate on it, and live it out. Father, we just pray for blessings over this family. Your, li- your word is life and it's truth. And we just pray that you be with them to understand the word as they read it together as a family. And that we can grow in you through your word. And we bless them in Jesus' mighty name. Amen. Amen. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Jackie. And Jackie Martinez is our director of uh, children and family uh, ministry. And if you missed out this time and you would like your child to receive a Bible, just talk to Jackie. You can write it in your connection card. All right. So how's everybody this morning? Yeah, a little tired, right? And, you know, the important question is, why are the Astros trying to kill me, right? Right. Oh my goodness, if you are not an Astros fan, don't start now, because I don't think they're done trying to kill us. Oh my gosh, last night was crazy. All right, um, last week we looked at a seemingly kind of random passage from 2 Timothy. Oh, before I do that, let me just encourage you, next week I'm starting a sermon series uh, entitled Abide, and we're, part, we're doing it uh, um, we're, we're doing a big day, and Rich is going to talk more about what it means to, to, to do a big day a, in a minute when he does the announcements. But I just want to say one thing about the sermon series that I'm doing. It's entitled Abide, which is an old word that means to live with, to dwell with. And a lot of us, you know, we want to know God, and we believe in God, and we believe in Jesus, and maybe we've made a profession of faith, But there's still this gap. We don't really feel like, you know, the the promise that Jesus makes is that he will abide with us and we will abide with him. And you may feel like there's a little bit of a gap between your faith and the reality. A little bit of a gap between you believing in him and you seeing him at work in your life. You experiencing him on a day-to-day basis. And that is what the sermon series is going to be about. It's about how to begin to experience God more fully and completely and see him at work changing your life and just abiding with him on a day-to-day basis. So I want to encourage you, as you think about inviting people to church next week, that you'll be able to tell them this should be a sermon series that hopefully will make a big difference in your life, maybe even change your life entirely. All right, so this week, no sermon series, just the Bible, which is awesome. Um, uh, A random passage from 2 Timothy chapter 3. So if you just want to open up your Bible with me, if you have one, if not, it is on the screen. Beginning in verse 14, chapter 3, Timothy 2. Listen now to the word of God. But you, Timothy... And again, Paul is writing to this young man named Timothy who is uh, at work spreading the gospel with, with Paul. He says, but you, Timothy, 
certainly know what I teach. Oops, that's no, that's verse 10. Let me go down to verse 14. You must remain faithful to the things that you have been taught. You know that they are true, for you know that you can trust those who taught you. You have been taught the holy scriptures from childhood, and they have been given you, they have given you the wisdom to receive the salvation that comes from trusting in Christ Jesus. All scripture is inspired by God and is useful to teach us what is true and make us realize what is wrong in our lives. It corrects us when we're wrong and teaches us to do what is right. God uses it to prepare and equip his people to do every good work. I solemnly urge you in the presence of God and the Messiah Jesus, who will someday judge the living and the dead when he comes to set up his kingdom. Preach the word of God. Be prepared, whether the time is fav favorable or not. Patiently correct, rebuke, and encourage your people with good teaching. For a time is coming when people will no longer listen to sound and wholesome teaching. They will follow their own desires and will look for teachers who will tell them whatever their itching ears want to hear. They will reject the truth and chase after myths. But you should keep a clear mind in every situation. Don't be afraid of suffering for the Lord. Work at telling others the good news and fully carry out the ministry God has given you. As for me, my life has already been poured out as an offering to God. The time of my death is near. I have fought the good fight. I have finished the race. I have remained faithful. And now the prize awaits me. The crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, will give me on the day of his return. And the prize is not just for me, but for all who eagerly look forward to his appearing. Amen. All right, so let me ask you, um, this might seem like a real basic question, but I'm going to ask it anyway. How do you know right from wrong? How do you know if you're living a moral life? How do you know if you're living your life based upon the right things? Now, I think that everybody was born with a sense that there is a right and wrong. You know, from the beginning, we know that there's kind of a justice to the world or there should be a justice to the world. But I do think that the system of morality, the content of what's right and wrong, that we have to learn that. And that we have to, we, you know, sometimes different people learn si different systems. You know, how do we know which system is right? You, you don't have to look any further than our two political parties to see that they, there can be a lot of disagreement about what is right and what is wrong. The... Um, the parties, each party thinks that they hold the moral high ground, that the side of the other is immoral and wrong. And, you know, quite honestly, um, when I look at both the parties, they both look like they do just about anything moral or immoral to stay in power, but never mind. The point I'm making is that sincere people can sincerely disagree on systems of morality. How do you know what's right and what's wrong? Well, in our uh, increasingly secular culture, our modern culture, we tend to put a lot of stock in science because science is very helpful in discovering lots of things. And I'm very, very thankful for science. I'm very thankful that we have all of the things that science has discovered. And, you know, we have the air conditioning and we have the modern medicine and we have all these things. And thank God for science and the scientists. But we are so dependent, our modern age is, on science that we begin to think that science can not only show us how to do things, but science can tell us if we should do it, whether it's right, whether it's wrong. And so some people have said, hey, well, let's just apply the, the scientific method to the question of morality, and we'll come up with, with, the, with the scientific system for, for right and wrong. And I don't think that's going to work. I don't think, I think, you know, even though science is good at telling us how to do things, I don't necessarily think science is good at saying whether or not those things should be done. For instance, science has given us the, a, 
uh, the, the power to harness and understand electricity, but science has also given us the atomic bomb. Science has shown us how to vaccinate, to prevent disease, but science has also provided Zyklon B, which was the poison gas that the Nazis used to exterminate millions and millions of people. Just because you are a good scientist doesn't mean that you are a good person. Just because we know how to do something, and science is very good at that, doesn't mean we know if we should do it. We, science is not going to answer this problem. How do we know right from wrong? And unfortunately, because we are so dependent on science these days, we begin to think that if science can't answer the question, there is no answer. And so in our modern culture, we increasingly don't think there is an answer because there is no objective outside of ourselves measure for right and wrong. We just have what we think about it. In other words, we have a morality that says, you do what's good for you, I do what's good for me. Our systems of morality are no longer objective outside of ourselves. Now they're just subjective. Everybody determines for themselves what's right and wrong. You do what's good for you, I'll do what's good for me. As long as I don't like get in your way, we'll just do it. You know, I don't think that's going to work either that our society is going to go through increasing, you know, we've got conflict, we've got a lot of conflict now, I think it's going to get worse because if you've got different people saying what's right and wrong, then how do you agree on anything? It's, I think our society is headed for trouble in that, in that sense. And look, we as Christians, we don't think that morality Right and wrong is just a matter of what we decide that it is. That there is an outside objective source for right and wrong, and that objective source is the God who made us. Our creator is the source, and our creator is the arbiter of whether there is right and wrong. That's why our scripture calls Jesus the judge. Can you put that verse for me up on the screen? Oh, yeah, the words in yellow are for the kids as they fill out the little puzzle, all right? That, that word has nothing to do with the sermon, okay? So just, that's for the kids to help them stay focused. So he urges him to do what he should be doing in the presence of God and in the Messiah, Jesus, who will someday judge the living and the dead. See, the judge is the one who determines what's right and wrong. And ultimately, God is the judge over all of us. And so our next question becomes, well, if there is this objective standard for right and wrong, and it doesn't matter what I think about it, then I better know what the judge thinks about it, and how do we know what God believes to be right and wrong? Right, we believe that God has revealed himself through his son Jesus. And one of the ways that you look is you just look at him. But we also believe that God has spoken his words through his prophets and through his apostles. And those prophets and apostles have recorded God's words in the Holy Scripture, which is why our passage says what it does about the Scripture, that it's inspired by God and is useful, it's reliable, that teaches what is true, and make us realize what is wrong in our lives. It corrects us when we're wrong and teaches us to do what is right. So a key word there is the word inspired. That all of Scripture is inspired by God. But we don't use that word the same way that the writer here meant the word. Because when we use the word inspired, we mean all kinds of things. For instance, how many of you watched the baseball game last night. How many of you watched the game? Pretty good number. The rest of you have some concept of what baseball is, right? Yeah, okay. Um, how many of you would be willing to say, and I would agree, that Jose Altuve was inspired last night, right? Yeah, absolutely. Jose was awesome. Uh, and that's the way we tend to use the word inspired, whether it's about a movie or about an athlete's performance. We mean that, man, it was really, really good. It was really, really encouraging. We were emotionally touched by it. We say that was inspired. 
That's not what the Bible means by inspired. The Bible, the, the, the word here in Greek, which actually is also connected to the Hebrew word in the Old Testament, the word inspired literally means to breathe into. So what this is saying is God breathed into the scriptures. He inspired them. And you think, well, what the heck does that even mean, right? Well, think back to Genesis chapter 2, where God is creating human beings. And it says that the Lord God formed the man from the dust of the ground, and he breathed the breath of life into the man's nostrils, and the man became a living person. God inspired the man. He breathed into him. And here's a little thing that you may or may not know. The word for breath in Hebrew and Greek and the word for spirit is the same word. Greek, uh, breath, spirit. What he's saying there is God shared his life-giving spirit and this little lump of dust and mud became a living thing. And that's what God is saying about the Bible. You know, sometimes you'll, you'll hear people disparage the Bible. Well, that was, it's just a, it's an old book written by a bunch of guys that are long since dead. Well, that's true. You know, Paul was writing a letter to Timothy. He, he didn't even think that he was writing scriptures. But what, what this is saying is that God used those simple, ordinary men, and he used their writing, and God breathed into it, and God's life-giving spirit fills these words so that the word of God, as Molly quoted earlier from Hebrew, the word of God is alive. And not just that, because we believe that the Holy Spirit is still active and at work today. That the Holy Spirit is still breathing through these scriptures, and if we read them, and we read them with attention, that this book is not like any other book. That God will breathe his words of life into these dead, spiritually dead, lumps of clay and mud, and he will create us into living, spiritually alive human beings. And he will show us right from wrong, good from evil. He will guide us in everything that we need. He will guide us into the ways of salvation. Now, that's why we spent so much time giving our kids Bibles. Now, I don't know if you noticed it or not, but uh, the Leaf family got a little uh, Bible, and we gave Bibles, you saw them give Bibles to the, to the kids, and the idea there is that we're called to share the Word of God with the next generation, and that is a very serious thing to do. Paul writes to Timothy, and he says, remember, since your childhood, you have been taught the Holy Scriptures. And God's, that's not just something God wanted to do for Timothy. We, we're commanded to share the word of God with the next generation. Deuteronomy. Deuteronomy, there it is. So commit yourselves wholeheartedly to these words of mine. Tie them to your hands. Wear them on your forehead as reminders. Teach them to your children. Talk about them when you are at home, when you are on the road, when you're going to bed, when you're getting up. Yes, our kids are born with a sense of right and wrong, which is why every kid, one of the first phrases they learn is, that's not fair, right? Because they have a sense that there should be a fairness to the world. But they have to learn what fairness really looks like. They have to learn what right and wrong looks like. And we... Yeah, I mean, it's true that we are a family and that, that, that our, we help each other teach our kids. But how many of you learned right and wrong? You're, how many of you, when you were a child, had your parent just drop you off at church and then drive away and pick you up when it was over? Is anybody in here like, because there are a few people like that. There's one back there. Anybody else? Two, three, four. Okay. That's not a majority, right? God can do some amazing things using the church. But for most of us, 
If we learn as a child, we learn from our parents that we as biological families have a huge responsibility to teach our children the faith. And that's why we partner with the parents to share the resources that we have so that you guys can be the primary disciple makers. You say, well, I, you know, trying to get your, man, trying to get your, in this day of YouTube videos and video games, it's hard to get your kids to read anything, much less read the word of God. But there are some tricks. I'm going to teach you the tricks. And kids, I'm going to teach you. Y'all don't pay attention to this. Y'all don't listen, okay? I'm going to teach the parents the tricks. So trick number one is when they start off this age, you read to them, right? You, you know, my, I raised five children. Five! They all survived, all of them. They laugh, but there were moments. There were moments. And... When they were very small, that age, maybe a little older than that age, um, we had a routine where, you know, in the evenings we would feed them, because you have to feed them, right? You do. You feed them, and then they throw everything everywhere, and then you clean it up, and then you put them in a bathtub because you just fed them and they got it all over themselves, and so you feed, you bathe them, and then after the bath, you sit down with them on the couch and you open up a storybook. And you will not have to work hard to get them to cuddle up with you. You know, when we had, we had twins, and the twins would be here and here as you sat on the couch. And they would both have their little heads on the chest, and, and you, would, you would read to them. You'd have your little arms around them, and you'd be reading to them. We had triplets, too. And then there'd be one here, one here, and then one just on you, Right? And they just love to, to snuggle, and you read them Harold in the Purple Crayon or Go Dog Go or whatever, but you can also read them from a Bible storybook like the one that we gave the Leaf family. And if you would like a copy of that, just write it on your connection card, and um, uh, Jackie will make sure that you get one or you, you know which version we used. Um, so when they're very small, you read to them, and it begins to put the Word of God inside of them. Now, they get a little older, and they can read for themselves, in theory. And we actually have kids that like to read mostly, and one of the things that we had to do was we did have to limit their screen time. Kids, don't listen to this part, okay? I'm just telling your parents this. We did have to limit. In fact, they weren't allowed to watch TV or to be on their phones, on the videos, or um, playing video games during the week. They could do it a little on the weekend, but we really did kind of limit it during the week when they, were, when they were elementary age and even into middle school. And, and you know, because, you know, it, it, they'll play video games until they starve to death, you know, at least mine would. Um, and I'm, I'm the same way. No, no, you know, I mean, you know, Diablo 3 is a great game. I like it. It's fun. I do. I play Diablo 3. My son's like, I don't play Diablo 3. That's because I'm playing it. Okay. Um, yeah, kill the devil. It's fun. Uh, anyway, um, yeah, but you have to kind of limit the screen time so they have other things that they're like, they got to entertain themselves some way. So that's one thing. But another thing is the evening meal. Now, I know that families struggle much more than they used to to sit down at dinner together, and maybe you can't do it every night. Maybe you can only do it once or twice a week, but do it when you can. And when you do it, turn off the TV, turn off the or put away the phones, right? And actually talk to each other. And you say, well, we don't even know how to talk to each other. You know, I ask them how they're doing. They say, fine. I ask them, what did they do at school? They say, nothing. Here's, here's, here's the trick. Here's what we use. We still use it. I know I've shared this before, but it's worth sharing again to encourage you. We just say, tell us three good things and one bad thing about your day. We still do that, even though they're seniors in high school. We still, Holly and I will do it with each other. Tell me three good things about your day. Tell me one bad thing about your day. Just to get you going, to interact with each other. Families that, that eat together and share together, they just, we just do better. And, you know, maybe you can't... Maybe you, the only time you can do it is after church on Sunday, or maybe you have breakfast together on Saturdays. I don't know what your schedule is, but try to find some time to do it. And here's, here's the pro tip. Pull out the Bible that we gave to you and have them read a story from it, or you read it. You can take turns. You know, parents can read, kids can read. Read, read a portion of it, and I really 
encourage you to read a story. You know, don't read a letter from Paul. That's a little harder. Read one of the stories from the four Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, about Jesus. Or read the stories in Acts about the early church. Or read some of the stories from Genesis or the first half of Exodus or the stories about the kings and the prophets doing all these wild things to each other. And then you just, you know, if, if, after you read a little bit, you talk about it. Or maybe you don't even need to talk about it. You just say, what do you think about that? Well, that was weird. You know, just, and don't be afraid of the questions because kids will come up with questions that you don't know the answers to. And you know what? It's okay. It's okay to say, you know what? I don't know. You could email me with questions. I love to get questions. My kids, my college kids occasionally text me and ask me Bible questions, which is beautiful. It's wonderful. I don't mind questions. I like questions. But the idea there is that as you get it out and you talk with each other, the Word of God will get into them because it is alive and active because that's what the Word of God does. Now, you may be at a time in your life when you don't have kids around the table. So you may be thinking, well, how does any of this apply to me? Well, of course, as a part of the church, you're still a part of kids' lives, right? That you're still participating in the life of the church. You're praying for the kids. You're providing some finances so we have the money to buy the Bibles for the kids. That, that you're maybe even participating in the children's or the student ministry. But here's the thing. You never stop learning the Word of God yourself. You don't stop when you're 18 years old, right? That, that that phrase from Deuteronomy chapter 11, commit yourselves wholeheartedly to these words of mine. There's no statute of limitations on that. It's a lifelong project of reading, studying, listening to biblical sermons. We never stop interacting with the God-breathed scriptures, learning what is right. All Scripture is inspired by God and is useful to teach what is true and make us realize what is wrong in our lives. Now, that last part's not very much fun, right? Teach us what is true. Correct us when we're wrong. I don't know about you, but I don't like being corrected when I'm wrong. I would just rather go on thinking that I'm right. A little later in the passage, there's that bit about itching ears, you know? That there, the time will come when people won't want to listen to good teaching, but instead they'll just want fi- to find teachers that will tell them what they want to hear. What is it that we want to hear? Everything's fine. You're doing great. You're wonderful people. You're not like those people out there. Those people out there are the ones with the problems. Let me tell you, Some sermons should just be about encouragement. Preach one last week, just about encouragement and hope, and people always gravitate to that because we always need some encouragement, and that's good. But look, if you never hear in a sermon that things might need to change with you, then you're not listening to biblical teaching. Because we all occasionally or constantly even need to be confronted with the idea that we are not perfect that God needs to change things about us. And sometimes the word of God, when you're reading it, man, that word of correction just jumps out at you, and you read that, and you go, I don't do that, or I should do that, and I'm not doing that, and boom, it hits you. Other times, it's more of a quiet whisper from that living spirit of God as he starts to go, and you start to go, am I, is he talking about me here, and... Yeah, probably. He probably is, right? Because if you never hear correction, then either you are perfect or you are not listening. And it's number two, right? It's not number one. So our society increasingly thinks that there's no objective standard for right and wrong, that right and wrong are just a matter of your opinion, and you're going to manufacture it yourself, and that's not going to end well. But here's the thing. Because you're not getting an objective standard from the society, you and I, we've got to be very, very intentional about learning it ourselves from God. We've got to be very intentional about training our children because they're not going to get the training out there. So we have to be dedicated and diligent 
to applying this word, this word to us, that we're called to learn to call what God, uh, uh, we're uh, to learn to call good the things that God calls good. So we have to be wise enough to realize that sometimes God is going to correct us, and we have to be humble enough to, to accept that correction. And look, when God corrects us, when God calls us to something different, it's not about God shaming us. It's about God saving us. It's about God saying, look, you need to change. You need to realize you need to change. You need to ask for forgiveness. But you know what? There is never a time when people ask for forgiveness and God says, no, I'm not going to give it to you. The only people that go unforgiven by God are the people that don't think they need it. So know that if you hear God's correction, that's God's grace. That's God's love. That's God pulling you into a closer relationship with him. And for those who listen, the judge of right and wrong offers a great prize. As Paul says, the prize now awaits me, the crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, will give me on the day of his return. The prize is not just for me, but for all who eagerly look forward to his appearing. So the question is, are you looking forward to, to, to the appearing of the judge who's going to tell everyone what right and wrong really is? Listen to him now. Listen to him now. Lord, we thank you that you do not leave us to wander in the dark, wondering if we are basing our life on nothing, if we're basing our life on exactly the wrong thing. We can know with confidence whether or not we're on the right path because you have shown us, you have told us with your inspired, God-breathed word. And so, Lord, Help us to once more sort of maybe rededicate ourselves to learning your word, to reading your word, to going to the Bible studies, to, to coming to church and hearing a biblical sermon, to spending some time with our family, reading the word together, to teach our children. Because we know that you want us to be in right relationship with you. And we thank you for the grace that you give us through Jesus but we don't want to come to the end of our life and appear before the judge and find out that we've been doing it all wrong. We want to know that we are looking forward to that crown of righteousness right here and right now. So thank you, Lord, for teaching us everything we need to know, including how to pray, as Jesus taught us, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Now there's a child that's